In bustling cities and remote villages, in the United States and around the world, orphaned children cried for their parents in 1918. People of all cultures struggled with the same terrible threat, and within a matter of months, as many as 50 million would be dead. What was that deadly threat? We had just come from a few years before from Mexico. My two brothers were uh, in one room sick. I was sick in the other bedroom with my mother. Mother told me that I thought her black hair was a cat, and I was afraid of it with a delirium from the high fever. My father's name is Telus for Reina. At that time, he was working in Tennessee for a DuPont company. He would always bring up the story about how he got sick while he was in Tennessee and how a lot of people from the village that had gone were brought back sick. In 1918, my mother was like just 11 years old, but she's, she remembers uh, the church bell would ring every day. The, there's a certain bell a notice for the death. And she said she remembers as a little girl how awful it sounded. Back in 1918, I was between 10 and 12 years old, I would say and I got the flu, and it was just my mother and I. We were two of my friends. We went to elementary school together, and both of them were stricken with the flu. And I would go out to Bayview Hospital, and they'd put her out on a porch in the cold winter time, and they had blankets, blankets, and a hood on, but she died. Both of them died. My mother was the midwife, and she tended to the people the uh, delivery of babies. She used to take me with her to go and visit the new mothers, and I loved to go see the new babies. And I cried because at that time she didn't want to take me with her because she was tending to the sick and the dying. One thing that stayed in my mind was the pounding of the nailing of boards together, making, I called them boxes, coffins for the people. An influenza pandemic is the emergence of a very new influenza A virus to which most of the population has not previously been exposed and does not have any immunity, no immune protection. Most people in the world are susceptible. And so what you see is very high numbers of people becoming sick uh, worldwide. My mother and father and my two sisters all had the flu. It was a very sad period. There was like a sadness over the city. I remember them telling me that a young neighbor, they saw him coming home. They watched from the window, he coming from work. And the next afternoon, they saw him carried out. He died. The influenza of 1918 was not only much more lethal than seasonal flu, the death rate was very high among young adults, strong young men and women working to support and care for their families. What was different about the flu that struck in 1918 and 1919? Brevig Mission is northwest of Nome, Alaska on the Bering Sea. The fact that Brevig exists today is remarkable. Since of the 80 residents in 1918, only eight survived the flu pandemic. Over 50 years ago, a medical student with an interest in viruses found his way to the village. So I went out on the grave site and started to dig. And on the end of the second day, I found the first victim. Eventually, I started to try to grow the virus, trying to find an alive influenza virus. Week after week after week after week, I got more and more discouraged. And eventually, I had no more specimen. And the virus was dead. 
more than 25 years passed, and new techniques for extracting DNA and RNA inspired a young molecular pathologist to try to identify and describe the virus that caused the 1918 flu pandemic. We were hoping to learn from what we see in 1918 to apply it to the future so that we could understand how pandemics form and why particular flu viruses cause more disease than others. In March of 1997, in Science News, there it was, 1918 pandemic virus found. A small sequence had been discovered by Jeffrey Tarnberg. I wrote a letter saying, if you need more specimens, let me know and I will go back to Alaska. And I got the permission to go because I photographed it with me. I knew where the, where the grave was. I noticed that there are some bodies at seven feet upon this uh, skeleton. And then next to the skeleton was a perfectly preserved woman. But I could see the skin, and it was of an obese woman. I started to do the postmortem. And here's the in insulation around protecting the lungs from decay. The Eskimos are not obese. There's not that much food around, and they were active and hard work, in particular in 1918. So find one who was, had extra calories, it was just remarkable. It became absolutely clear that we would be able to sequence the rest of the virus from that material. What we hope are to identify mutations that are so crucial to this process that if a bird virus were to adapt in the future to a human, that they would have to acquire some of the same changes. You could particularly design drugs that might block or bind to that particular change to prevent a bird virus from actually functioning in humans. We know that the new 2009 H1N1 virus is in almost every country of the world already, and it was only first detected in, as a new virus, recognized as a new virus in late April. So in just a matter of months, we've seen uh, every continent in the world and virtually every country affected. In 1918, there wasn't even a realization that the pandemic flu was caused by a microbe, by a virus. They had no idea what it was. There were no vaccines at the time, nor were there any treatments directly against the virus, and there wasn't the intensive care capabilities that we now have in hospitals. We are infinitely better prepared now than we were 100 years ago back in the beginning of the 20th century.